we are back. This is Steve Sanson, Jim Jonas, and Troy Warren, Veterans of Politics. On a brand new, brand new studio. We're with, um, I don't even know who we're with anymore. All new media, all new media, leaving uh, Vegas All Net Radio. You know, we were with All Talk Radio before, Jim. That's correct. Yep. Years ago, and um, and then we went with, with uh, Vegas All Net Radio, and, and then it was bought out by several different folks right. through that course of those five years over there. And now we're back with All Talk Radio, but now it's all new media with George Carson, you know. You know, he just brought us back. Took a took a what a hiatus after six years. Brought us back. We've been on the air for eleven years. Well, you know, let's see how everything goes, and you know, we'll see if we're gonna hang out with George. I, I don't like George, by the way. I don't, I don't know. What do you think? I do. I like George. You like? Him? Yeah, I think George is a good guy. George is cool. Yeah. yeah. But Troy, you just met. I've met. No, I mean, I've known George for a couple of months now. Yeah. I met him when we had Silo on the program. Oh, oh, okay, yeah, that that that, that one guy. Yeah. yeah, that that one guy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Now all of a sudden he's a popular guy. I see him all over Facebook now. Oh, dude, he's just kicking it. That's <laughs> what happens. That's what happens. George actually spends a lot of time with him. Yeah. Well, George needs a new um, um side man, so I only picked him, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why. You know. But you know we have, we're gonna have two guests today. We're gonna have um, Bonnie Polly, who's a police chaplain for Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, and we're gonna have Tony Baca, candidate for Nevada Assembly District Five. So, anybody got anything to say today? No, not, not really. I've had an interesting, <laughs> interesting last couple of weeks, but yeah. nothing that I'm gonna put out on air. Yeah. How about you, Troy? I, I like you. I've had a pretty interesting couple of weeks. However, the one thing that just it just gets dumber and dumber by the day on the Republican side of the ticket. You know, it's like, really, I really don't, I do not care who's doing who. <laughs> I don't care if Cruz is banging the entire Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders outfit. You know, I, I don't. And you just, I just, because he didn't tag you in. That's pretty <laughs> much. Yeah. But the thing is, it's like, I want to know when you do the job. Right. You know, but we get so sidetracked and so distracted with, with this stuff mm -hmm. it's hard to find you know i'm really disappointed that jim webb bowed out yeah. um i really liked him i thought he was a middle he's an old jfk democrat yeah. style you know veteran yeah. war veteran from my desert storm i believe um you know and i don't know if you noticed it did you, did you watch the libertarian presidential debate last night between uh mcafee johnson and i forget who that other guy was but on uh, it was actually live or live it was taped however stossel was the the moderator on mm -hmm. fox news business it's actually pretty cool yeah. it's actually cool to watch actually you know i mean they did you learn anything um for the most part yeah you know yeah. i mean they, they were i was able to see them live you know right. not just read excerpts of them they actually made it to a program well, not only if you heard this, you know Gary Johnson actually polled 11 percent in the nation the other day. Wow! Do you know how huge that is for a third party? Yeah, that is pretty large. I think the. I mean, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, a third party's coming out of nowhere. I mean, mm -hmm. changes are happening. Yeah. Not as fast as I would like to see it, but I mean, changes are happening. Yeah, I've always, I've always uh, talking to, uh, liber especially people from the Libertarian Party. I've always said in any third party. I've always told them, I said, you know, I think what you have to do is you have to focus more on getting people more in a l lower level of state, like uh, state assembly, uh, state senate, uh, even county commission, uh, city council. You start getting um, people in the real grassroots. You start get build, build from there, and I think you'll even see the uh, percentages go even higher. Because I think um, when you look back historically, third party candidates, 11% is huge. I think if you look at what Ross Perot, Ross Perot was at 21%. Mm -hmm. And I think the only reason why Ross Perot caught on is because he had the money to catch on. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So I just think that if these libertarians, if they can get more support from the lower, the lower level races, I think you will start to even see a larger groundswell. I, you know, I, I tend to agree with that because you know there's there's just there's a different thought process going around this time. Obviously, there's still your, you know, it's like I'm running for office too. You know, and everybody asks me, it's like you run on the libertarian side, or are you conservative or liberal? I go, I'm neither. 
Right. And they're yeah. like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, I'm just a pissed off American who's tired of the crap. Right. You know, I'm not red. I'm not blue. I'm not green. I'm not purple. Yeah. I'm just an American wanting to change the system. And this is the only way I know how is to stick my stick my foot in it, you know, mm. stick my foot in the door and say, hey, stop. And, you know, I shook the tree pretty hard in 2014 because I captured 40% of the vote from a four-time incumbent Democrat. And so much so, it, sh- it shook him up so much so that, you know, he actually called me and I had lunch with him. Yeah. Um, Did he pay? Yeah. Okay. Which was surprising. And, you know, so this this go-around, I think I've, I think I have a better-than-average chance of winning. Like, I've got some name recognition out there thanks to Steve. And and Jim, you know, thanks to you two, this program for a lot of it, that veterans, in, I tell you that that veterans in politics endorsement interview that I did two years ago catapulted me to areas I never even thought was I didn't even know existed. So I yeah. I love this stuff. You know, speaking of that, I just want to let the listeners know that uh, we're we're going to be starting our endorsement process uh, April ninth and ninth and tenth, uh, Saturday and Sunday, coming over at Rhythm Kitchen Restaurant. And uh, and uh, we're going to be promoting it big time on um, Kevin Walsh show. We made a deal with him, so so it should be interesting. That's yeah. cool. Yeah, I love the I love those panel interviews. Those are, yeah. those are a lot of fun. Yeah. If not, if nothing else, it just it's nice being on. I like them now. Right. Now, if I ever decide to go back on the other side, I don't know. <laughs> but I really I really enjoy them now, though. I like putting people on the hot seat and see if they can they can handle it. And just so the listeners out there know, uh, Troy handled himself rather well last time. So it'd be uh, it'll be fun doing it again. Well, just so you know, that was like I said, that was my first time ever doing anything like that. And like I told you on the on the on the stage, man, I was felt like I was gonna puke because I was yeah. so nervous, never having done that before. But the, really, there was. I mean, it's not like Tame or Zola's. No, it's just answer <laughs> yeah, the, answer right, truthfully. Right, right. Just, just answer truthfully. Well, well you, you know, Tame or Zola is the Marine MMA fighter, and um, yeah, I, every time I'm there, I watch him fight. And one time he was tired, exhausted, fighting. Another time he lost the fight, and another time he threw up. Right? Yeah. So now I'm not there, and he kicked the crap out. Oh, of Oh, dude, he cleaned house. It looked like <laughs> when I'm not there, I'm like, what the hell is that? He put on the best <laughs> fight ever, and not even there. <laughs> you know. So kind of, but you know, I do have a rant. You know, today I was leaving my house, you know, minding my own business, and I heard some domestic violence situation going on, and and uh, I got involved because the 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 dude slammed the girl on the ground. That's and, not cool. Yeah, so I, I got involved, and you know, I said cut the crap, and uh, then he turned on me, and started talking smack. So I called the police, right? Tore the number off the off the off the building, you know, so I wouldn't give the police the right number. And then the female was defending the guy. So yeah. So you females out there, <laughs> I, I'll tell you this. You know, there, there, there was a situation um, um, a couple of days ago. Female was almost decapitated inside her house, and they found the guy naked in the car, um, crashed into a Chevron. Did, did you remember? That? Do you hear about that? Yeah. yeah. You, you females out there, you are getting your ass whooping, you're defending the dude that's beating your ass. You might end up dead. So be careful. I, you, that's that's a. It still blows my mind. Don't defend somebody that's. I mean, don't 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 protect somebody that's beating your ass against somebody who's trying to help you out. <laughs> this, exactly. This good sense. But anyways, you know, let's uh, let's take a commercial break and uh, let's come back with I believe Bonnie Polly, Bonnie Polly, police chaplain for the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. We'll be right back, folks. This is Steve Sanson, Jim Jonas, and Troy Warren, veteran of politics. Hi, my name's Annette Levy. Did you know that we usually elect judges based solely on name recognition? So here goes. My name's Annette Levy. My name's Annette Levy. My name's Annette Levy. Now for those of you who might want to know a little more, I have 29 years legal experience, 15 years arbitrator, 11 years judge pro tem. I'm ethical. I'm experienced. I want to be your district court judge in Department 20. And by the way, my name's Annette Levy. Paid for by the committee to elect Annette Levy. If you'd like to know more, visit her website at electannette.com. 
Paul Padilla is a proud sponsor of Veterans and Politics. Attorney Paul Pata, a former federal prosecutor, is ready to fight for you. If you've been injured in a car accident, call Paul. Been a victim of a medical malpractice at the VA? Call Paul. Suffered a slip and fall? You better call Paul. Paul Pata Law, 702-366-1888. That's 702-366-1888. Or check us out on the web at paulpadda.com. That's paulpata.com. You fought for our country, now let us fight for you at Paul Pata Law. Oh, we are back. I, I was waiting for the for the for the music to go. That's that's our program. But Bonnie, you know this is the first time we're in the studio, and and so we we kind of trying to get the bugs out. First guest. Well, well, for, first, first time, time as as a host, I've been here twice as a as, as a guest. Bonnie Polly, who's a police chaplain for the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. Yes. How how, how you doing today? I'm doing good, and I'm learning all about all new media. All new media. It's really a new. It's new for me. It's new for us too. So. I hope to learn on how to do it on my phone. Okay, you you can put the headphones on if you want. Oh really? Yeah. And then you hear something. Yeah, you, you you'll hear, hear you'll hear, hear your voice. Yeah. Unless somebody call in, but um, it's I don't know if anybody's gonna call in today because they hardly anybody know we're here. <laughs> but let's, they will know. They will know. Let's but, hope it goes. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Bonnie, could you tell us a little bit about you? Well, uh, I'm Bonnie Polly, and I've been in Las Vegas for. 52 years oh, yeah. we we raised uh, our three sons in yeah. las vegas and uh, it's it's we almost feel like we're natives right. my husband david who just died in january my, was, a, my was a practicing attorney here in yeah. las vegas yeah. and i'm a deacon in the episcopal church oh wow which uh qualifies me to become chaplain for the chaplain at the clark county detention center how, how does that, how does that, I mean, I mean, explain your, your, your daily duties. Uh, doing that. Well, my role at Clark County Detention Center is to be the spiritual person for some 4,000 inmates. Wow. And we work very closely with uh, individual inmates. We work very closely with their families. Uh, we're, I would say, the liaison okay. between the inmate and family, the inmate and lawyer, the inmate and the court system. Wow. And uh, I, I coordinate all of the uh, faith, faith-based uh, services that come into the jail. Okay. And uh, we tr- try very hard to at least allow an inmate to have some type of service of his choice or her choice okay. once a week. Okay. So we see rabbis and imams and uh, Roman Catholic priests mm-hmm. and uh, pastors and uh, uh, Buddhist monks and wow. and it's 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 on all faiths it's all faith faith all faiths are honored and recognized. So you you do the same thing uh, for the, for the officers that pass in uh, the line of duty as well. No, really, my role is the with inmates center? at Clark County Detention Center, okay. although I've been at the Clark County Detention Center for 34 years. Oh, wow. So the officers are also uh, very important to me, and so I would say, yes, I'm their chaplain, too. Okay. They're also, I'm, I'm more of a correctional chaplain than a police chaplain. They're the correctional officers, and mm. then they're the police officers. The What's police, the difference? Police, po- police officers on the streets. Okay. They drive the black and white, right. whereas the correctional officers are work are work in in detention right. centers. Um, and and the, there are police chaplains that are assigned to each substation throughout the valley. Gotcha. And uh, we began that program. Uh, Oh boy, it's probably been close. To, I bet you close to ten years ago, okay. and so there are at least one, hopefully more, uh, ministers, uh, our ministers, rabbis, imams, uh, right. faith-based people who are police chaplains for the substation people. Gotcha. Yes. Jim. So how how did you uh, how did you come about to uh, get this job? I mean, it's just. I, I think that like some people that would go into would, would uh, choose uh, to to be involved with uh, with any kind of faith based things. What, why the detention center? Well, I really do. Uh, I, I believe that uh, this is what God really told me to do. I can remember as a small child, 
I was born and raised in Lake Charles, Louisiana, and my daddy was a lawyer in downtown Lake Charles, which was a small, accent. small <laughs> town. And I used to uh, go outside of his office, and I would look up at the jail, and I would see the inmates looking out at the jail, making terrible noises and right. screaming and hollering. And I thought, you know, if somebody could just go in and talk to those people, they might not be so mean. Yeah. And uh, I believe that was probably my first calling. And uh, then I was uh, born and raised in the Episcopal Church yeah. and uh, turned out to be about 35 years old and had quite a spiritual awakening and right. met, uh, met Jesus. Yeah. And uh, I think he sent, me to, he sent me to jail. He first sent me to prison. Wow. And I ministered, uh, yeah, ministered in the prisons with an organization called Friends Outside. And we worked with families, including the inmate, and uh, acted acted as their liaison. And we drove a we drove a, a, tra- we, a school bus out to the prison that was at Gene at that time, a uh, Gene prison, in, which was called Southern Nevada Correctional Center, has closed down. But when it first opened, it was out in the middle of nowhere. And of course, a lot of most most everybody who has family and prison don't have automobiles to drive 35, 30, 40 miles. So we began that transportation. Right. And while the uh, family would be um, family, mostly women and children, and grandmas and aunts and uncles would be visiting with their inmate, we would uh, walk the yard, right. uh, talking to the talking to the inmates, okay. and. Uh, finding out exactly oh, where they were coming from and what they were planning to do once they got out of prison, and then we would just continue to work with them. As is the repeat offenders, is that, is that huge? Or is lots, that, yeah. Is it? yeah. They, uh, I'll probably get a little bit of argument from the prison system about this, but, uh, but I would be willing to venture that it's at least – 60 percent 60 percent and i think it's probably a little more but wow. uh they they'll 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 correct me i'm sure about you think that. they're institutionalized or they just i think a lot care? of people are mm. it's safe to be in prison really well because you have a you have a, a place to sleep and you have food to eat and uh too often when a man or a woman get out of prison they uh, don't have anywhere to live and they don't have any job well i, I put a high and, price on freedom so. you know and uh <laughs> and 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 so if you're without any means at all right. and you and you're coming from that background uh, a lot of times it's just easier to reoffend gotcha. yeah well, which I, is which is sad yeah it is but it's but i'm afraid it's true i have a question <sighs> you ever in fear of your life? I mean, obviously you've been doing this for a while, but you've got to be around some of the meanest, roughest men and women, because there's some women that I wouldn't even want to mess with. There, You know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah. have you ever been assaulted? Have you ever, how do they, do you go in with guards? Do you, how well, does that yes. work? I work up, you know, anytime that I go into a unit, which is, uh, which is often because I have free reign of the jail, right. but, um, uh, they're they're there with me, and uh, but no, I'm I have, I'm not afraid. And uh, the the inmates usually uh, uh, like what I have to offer because right. I'm gonna give them something. I'll give them I'll give them a Bible or I'll give them a Koran or I'll just so you don't talk judge. with them. You and don't I, judge. I try not to judge. I was uh, conked one time. You were. And uh, uh, you were a cop. I was cold cocked. Oh, cold cocked. Really? I say you were a cop at one time. No, mm-hmm. one, oh, okay. one time I was cold cocked. I was down in the solitary area of the jail, and an uh, a, a inmate was not happy with, with obviously wasn't very happy with me, and put his fist through the food port and connected with my eye. Oh, wow. So that was not fun. But that's the only time in 34 years, so I feel that I feel pretty fortunate. Wow. Okay. Well, she answered my question because I yeah. just, I mean, I, God bless you. I mean, you, you, you are way stronger than I'll ever be because there's no way I would even step I foot that, to do that. I think I have to just know that uh, I'm supposed to be there, right, right. and uh, and really and truly, most most inmates uh, 
for the majority are people who just uh, have done something that they shouldn't have done for whatever reason. And hopefully, hopefully, my presence or, the, or this or my staff uh, will will assist that person in uh, re readdressing what they need to do so that they so that they can become uh, viable citizens. How, how how large is your staff? I have one part time person, and then a, a lot of volunteers. I probably work with about two hundred and fifty volunteers okay. who come into the jail for for what whatever reason you know for services or just one on one visits. I so, work with the faith community in Las Vegas. So, what type what type of message would you give folks that are listening for them not to end up in in the detention centers? Well, what, what would you tell them? before they end up there? Ooh. Well, I think uh, I would have to venture to say that the reason why most people are in jail today mm-hmm. uh, is indirectly or directly caused from drug use. And, uh, so a huge percent, percentage of those are in the I would jail. say I would say a very high do, percentage of people who, are, who, do, who, who get themselves in trouble are because of, uh, because of addiction problems. So do, do you think that... Um, we as a society should treat um, oh definitely um, perks is what the cops call them instead yeah. of incarcerating yeah. them yes uh-huh. them. if there there are those folks who belong in prison okay. and and they're probably those folks who who should never be let, let out of prison right. but i really do believe that those folks are the the minority okay. and i think that if a person has an addiction and is really ready to do something about that addiction, they can begin to recover. Uh, and we should certainly make it possible right. and do everything in our power to uh, make it possible. We have a, a pretty good program through the courts right. at the present time in drug court. Uh-huh. And if uh, folks are sentenced to drug court, then they have the opportunity of, uh, of addressing their drug addiction and and do and beginning to do something about it through counseling and uh it's very structured and if if that happens and if they're successful um a west care uh hat west West care is a wonderful treatment center salvation (laughs) army is one of the best right Uh, so what's your faith base i'm a i'm a deacon in the episcopal church in the episcopal church Mm -hmm. Do, do you believe in a death penalty no i don't have you ever um, showed up to a death penalty? Um, I've never, situation? I've never sat while someone's mm-hmm. being uh, uh, put to death. But I have worked a lot right. with people who are on death row. Have you ever given any type of um, um, recommendation uh, uh, with inmates uh, seeking parole? Yes, I have. You have. Yes. Um, um, how many of those have you ever done? Oh gosh. I just wouldn't be able to give you a number. Okay. Uh, what's the number of, what's the percentage um, of folks you, you told the parole uh, committee that, that maybe they shouldn't be let out? Have you ever said that? No, no, I haven't ever said that. So you, no. you, you've, you've agreed to let out everybody? Well, I think that. I or think everybody every, you, you've seen. I think everyone who, uh, I think everyone could, could come to the place in their lives that they would, uh, They'd be okay to be let out. Okay, so if they choose, it's about choice. So it's making uh, the right choices. Um, I, so you recommended everybody to be paroled. So has anybody ever been paroled on based on your recommendation? No, I don't think so. No. All right, let me let me let me re, 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 rephrase my question. Has anybody been paroled um, that you you um, actually? Um, recommended for them to be parole and but yet they end up back in jail and you wish you didn't well i think that many many people uh re-violate right and uh and uh i uh that makes me sad okay. but it goes to show me too that that jail and prison is is uh, probably not really the complete answer to the right. problem we really need to work with uh people the minute that they come into the system, we need to be address whatever it is that needs addressing addiction problems, uh, okay. any type mental mental health issues, uh, uh, 
and 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 then I think we're, we would be money ahead of the game. What about the correction officers? Uh, have any correction officers you, you've seen in your 34 years you've been in, in in the prison system that that you figure that maybe that's not the right job for them? <laughs> I think I could probably say that. Uh, I could Very probably say correct, in the uh, in the beginning of yeah. my career right. as a as a chaplain, there were some correctional officers that maybe should have uh, chosen other things to do. However, or maybe they should be one of the inmates. <laughs> however, uh, <laughs> however, I don't really, I, I, I truly cannot say that today. Okay. I think uh, the How correction- long ago are we talking? Oh, we're talking 25 years ago, oh, maybe. Okay. maybe. That was a different police force back then, yeah. too. Yes, that and, was a uh, whole different realm but, of stuff. Yeah. But today, uh, it's a very professional organization. Yeah. Metro is... Uh, is is just in my opinion one of the finest, one of the very finest organizations in the in the whole world in the whole country. Have you had a pleasure of speaking with a sheriff, the new one? Yes, uh huh. Uh, how do you, how does he strike you? I uh, I, I like uh, Sheriff Lombardo very much. Okay. How many sheriffs have you worked for? Oh gosh, I started with uh, I think I might have started with John Moran. Moran, okay. And. Uh, Jerry Keller. Is that his son that's running for school board? Yes. He's yeah, a, he's a lawyer here in town. Yeah, that's what I thought, yeah. Okay. All right. But well. I've seen a lot of them come yeah. in and come and go. Bonnie, what, 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 what would you, what would you, I don't know, I, I think I'm going back to the same question again, but um, I, I think that that, uh, that 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 maybe some of your um, your wisdom and, and, and your spirituality, uh, what, what would you tell folks about this prison system and and they don't really want to actually end up there what would you say to them well i just think you ha- you need to uh re re reassess your actions right. you re- you need to reassess what you really want to get out of your life right. you you need to reassess who you want to be as a person and uh and i would uh say in the very beginning you really need to try god right Amen that, to that. Because that's okay. the answer, I believe. Any, anybody got anything else for Bonnie? No, I think that was about, I think you said it about right. Thank I really you. Do. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you very much. Thanks I enjoyed it. Well, Bonnie, thank you so much for yeah. coming on, and thank you for, um, um, because what you do is actually a, a, a thankless job, and it's, it's, a, it's a service that, that we really can't put money on it, and it's something that, that, uh, that, uh, that you you do to save lives you know and we appreciate that well you know i uh it's a passion yeah uh, i've, I've uh, every day when i walk into the jail i seem to come alive mm-hmm. and uh many many people now are asking me when am i gonna hang it up right. and uh, <laughs> and i tell them that i don't probably i don't believe i will right. that they Good can just you. carry me out on a slab <laughs> wow well uh, Bo- bonnie thank you so much that's bonnie Holly, who's a police chaplain for the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. If anybody would like to visit um, um, the chaplain, Polly, end up in Clark County Detention Center. <laughs> this is Steve Sanders. better yet, come to church. Come to church. And where's your church at? Christ Church Episcopal at 2000 South Maryland Parkway, which is on the corner of East St. Louis and Maryland Parkway. And w- when will you be there? I'm there every Sunday. and What time? Of ten, from from seven o'clock in the morning till noon at least. Okay, well, very good. Yeah, we have three services, two Anglo services, one Hispanic service, okay. another Hispanic service How's in your the Spanish, evening. By the way? Well, it's I'm trying. Okay, all right, <laughs> all right. That's Bonnie Polly, Police Chap for the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. This is Steve Sanson, Jim Jonas, and Troy Warren, veterans of politics. Don't go away, folks. We have Tony Baca, candidate for Nevada Assembly District Number Five. My name's Annette Levy. Did you know that we usually elect judges based solely on name recognition? So here goes. My name's Annette Levy. My name's Annette Levy. My name's Annette Levy. Now for those of you who might want to know a little more, I have 29 years legal experience, 15 years arbitrator, 11 years judge pro tem. I'm ethical. I'm experienced. I want to be your district court judge in Department 20. And by the way, 
My name's Annette Levy. Paid for by the committee to elect Annette Levy. If you'd like to know more, visit her website at electannette.com. Paul Pata Law is a proud sponsor of Veterans and Politics. Attorney Paul Pata, a former federal prosecutor, is ready to fight for you. If you've been injured in a car accident, call Paul. Been a victim of a medical malpractice at the VA? Call Paul. Suffered a slip and fall? You better call Paul. Paul Pata Law, 702-366-1888. That's 702-366-1888. Or check us out on the web at paulpadda.com. That's paulpata.com. You fought for our country, now let us fight for you at Paul Pata Law. Well, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is Jim Jonas, Troy Warren, and Steve Sanson with another episode of Veterans of Politics. Uh, Steve has uh, had to step out of the studio for a minute. So uh, right now we have Tony to- Baca. Tony Baca, who is running for state assembly uh, number five. Tony, how are you doing this afternoon? Great, great. Good. Good Can you, you give the uh, listeners a brief bio about yourself? In the political world, or well, yeah, I'll little as a general, yeah. yeah. Uh, basically, I've been in um, Las Vegas since 1997. I have um, I've been married for almost uh, 21 years, and I have three kids. I grew up here. Um, my oldest 22. I got a 21 year old son, 22 year old son, 21 year old son, and my daughter's 19. Um, I'm actually in the financial. I've been in the financial industry for quite some time through insurance and mortgages, for the most part, commercial lending and different types of lending. Um, very active in the community, um, you know, from, I used to feed the homeless downtown on A Street and Owens, and then uh, in 2010, I got involved in, uh, in a senatorial campaign and changed my life. So can you give the listeners, uh, just, I know a gerrymandering, it gets kind of crazy, but just a general uh, idea of uh, the boundaries of state assembly number five. Oh, sure, yeah. On the west side, you're looking at uh, Wallapai. Ish, and it's not a square exactly, but on the so you got Wallapai on the west, you got um, Flamingo on the south, um, and then it cuts over to Rainbow, and then about DI it goes down to Jones, you know, or yeah, DI it goes down to Jones, and then and then it circles to um, or goes to Alta, so just a little bit uh, north of Ch- um, Ch- Charleston. Okay, yeah. so it's not that much different than it was before, because I remember in '08. This was before they uh, redistrict everything, so it's pretty much about it's pretty similar to what it was uh-huh. before. Same area. I have co- I know the last couple of people that ran in that district. Um, so why the assembly? Well, th- I think it was a good starting point for me. And so I had uh, just to give you a little background. I had started you know, I had started working for a U.S. senatorial campaign as a volunteer in 2010. Eventually became the coalition director, which means I did a lot of outreach. And what happened was, um, because so many people were so passionate about doing something for the country, we had more inreach than I had to do outreach. Okay. And uh, and basically, what happened was, I met so many well great people, but I started interviewing and listening to veterans and what they had been through in in our for our country, and you know, put their lives on the line for different, you know, from Vietnam, from Korea to Vietnam to Iraq, you know, different um, wars. And I just sat there, and it changed my life. And so fast forward just a little bit after the campaign, I was still getting phone calls saying, and this was 2010, I think unemployment was about 20% um, at least. And um, they'd say, Tony, can you help us get jobs? You know, Can you help us get jobs? And, and these guys changed my heart so much. I was like, I got to do something for these great Americans that um, I can't leave them behind, or I got to do something. I'm just a regular Joe, but I, gotta, I can't just say no. So I eventually ended up going to North Dakota, um, you know, to work and find jobs for veterans. So that's sort of, so going forward a little bit, a lot of my friends are saying, well, Tony, are you going to be here? I said, let me just go work up in North Dakota, help find jobs, and I'll be back. So I got back, um, and I, I'd been thinking about running for an office because people would say, run for this, run for that. And it's a very big commitment, as you know. I mean, it's, you know, your word's got to be your word, and there's a lot of um, pressure and learning and things like that. So I actually thought about it since 2010. So what happened was when I um, I got a phone call that Irv Nelson, which is the assemblyman in my district now, had actually flip-flopped. You know, he had prom- made some promises, and one was uh, voting down the shocking. commerce tax. Yeah, Very shocking. Yeah, and, and so a lot of people liked him. And then when that happened, they were like, Tony, would you run? 
And just to let you know, I would not run against somebody if they just did a good job. I don't need to run. I work, you know? Right. And so that's when I decided to enter the race. Okay. Very good. Uh, so you, you had talked about then um, it, it, uh, your, uh, the guy flip-flopping on uh, raising taxes. Uh, we've ran into – that's that seems – the major theme behind a lot of why people are running this time and there's a there's a there's a lot of anger in, in there's a lot of anger among people for doing that um now you know uh the question i wanted to ask was uh, we were interviewing jim wheeler and uh some of wheeler's a really good guy and he, he brought up a couple things that i didn't i wasn't aware of uh-huh. so this uh this um uh, election cycle or this this next legislative session, uh, the state is looking at probably a four million dollar um, shortage because of when uh, the governor a couple years ago decided to go ahead and set up the state exchange mm-hmm. for for uh, Medicare and set that up, then the federal government was would take uh, was going to pay ninety percent of that cost over the first two years. Mm-hmm. Well, now the two years are up. Right. And so now they're not going to do that. So that leaves us a $4 million shortfall. Now, I know the governor has proposed that all state agencies cut 5% mm-hmm. to make up for that. However, uh, on the Democrat side, they're they're going to push really hard again to increase taxes in sure. order to make up for that uh, $4 million shortfall. Mm-hmm. What do you think is the best way to uh, make up for that to make up for that shortfall is it in fact raising taxes or how how do you propose to come up with that revenue shortage well um i'm not an expert at all the you know taxes and all the right. issues right now because I'm, I'm learning as quickly as possible but number one i don't believe in raising taxes i know we have to the government has to function on taxes right. but i think that we need to really look at where's the spending going you know and so I did meet with a group um, this last week, and they said, well, you know, we're public workers, and, you know, the shortfalls of the PERS, and, you know, they got some, inve- you know, they're invested, and we want to retire and have money and things like that. So, um, I, I, you know, they were saying, you're, you're against taxes. I said, I'm not against taxes, but it's that, it's that out of, you know, that crazy spending that we do, um, where sometimes if you look into it, if you have fair, if you have fair um, contracts or open contracts where everybody can bid, um, you can get better deals on buildings, supplies, things like that. So I really think we have to look at where we're spending now. And I think there's plenty of money there to um, make up for that shortfall. Well, and if you take a look at, you just brought up PERS. Mm-hmm. The amount of money that is being spent on per, you know, retirements and different things of that nature, right. there's a lot of cuts that can be going on right there. That whole program needs to be revamped because people are coming out working for the state for 20, 25 years, being able to retire 40, 50, 80 at, at more than, you know, at the age of, you know, oh, age, a, I a, think age 45 or yeah. 50, uh-huh. you know, and they're getting 80, 90% of their pay do that in the private sector. Right. So I, there's a big amount of cuts there. Cause I, I, I got hit with that last time I ran because the, the people were upset that I actually brought that up. Right. Well, no, you're messing with my retirement. Well, guess what? I'm paying for it. So the other thing that um, one of the things I wanted to do, and I want to get your opinion on it, nobody's ever done an audit really of anything. Right. And I think we need to do a top-down audit. So if, I mean of everything. What's your opinion on that? I, I – I completely support an audit. And even with um, PERS, for example, if you look at the committees that uh, the proponents of PERS, they're all made up of public employees. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I imagine so, that. Right. So instead of having a committee, for example, with a PERS, having a committee of, of um, taxpayers or you know non, non-government employees and government employees, put them together and, and look at the budget opposed to one side controlling everything. And, and you're correct. You know, having audits... Um, throughout the government and finding out uh, where excess spending is, you know? And I, so we know that there's extra money being spent on, you know, that shouldn't be spent. So my, uh, so one of the things that uh, I always find difficult with uh, state assembly candidates is that the overall knowledge of the voters, and I think it's gotten better actually over the years, but it's, it's still lacking, is 
an understanding of what exactly a state assemblyman does. Mm-hmm. Um, how are you, and the importance of a state assemblyman? When you're when you're running, how are you getting out there to uh, get people to understand that voting for the state assemblyman is important? Uh, why it's important to get people to uh, voter turnout? Well, that's a that's a good question because as you know. When I get, I do a lot of events, okay, so I'm not, I don't hang around with the political people because, you know, they're for you already, you know, that kind of thing. So my thing is outreach to whatever community. I, 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 what's interesting, I mean, you'll find some communities where they do know what a legislator is. A lot of them don't. They don't even know where their district is. And so trying to share with them what we do as far as um, uh, making laws or, you know, or repealing budget. laws. or Pardon me? Budget. Yeah, budget. All that kind of thing, um, it's part of a, it's sort of like an education process. It really is. I mean, I'm growing and I'm learning and I'm drawing in information as fast as possible. As a matter of fact, uh, I think it was Wednesday night, we had a, um, a, a get together with like eight, ten candidates, and then we had experts in different fields, you know, like, like even the uh, margins tax and, and Common Core and different things like that. So we can learn and then translate that to all the people that we meet with so they can start understanding. Wow, the importance! What what a difference a state legislator will make, and, and the, you know when they get elected. One of the uh, one of the things that I always like to ask uh, any candidate, uh, and, but especially any uh, legislative candidate, whether it's state or federal, um, can you just uh, briefly give me three? Because I don't like to go past three. Because I that's it's kind of like my litmus test with candidates. If they <laughs> promise me that they're going to do more than three, maybe five things in a session, <laughs> I, I just blow them off because I know, okay, right, you're right. full of it. So if you could give me just, just generally, give me like the major three things that you would like to accomplish or be involved in when you get elected for your first session. And, and I think you're absolutely right about that. If you say, I'm going to do this, and I promise that. I think if I can help people move one, you know, one thing or two, right, that'd yeah. be a, that'd be an accomplishment. So, before I answer that, so here's who we're looking at now is is I look at it like we have some great candidates right now. We formed sort of a team of people that think alike. Like we we signed the um, the contract with Nevada, right. ten things that we all agree on, and so we feel that. Um, I started pick. I started seeing it the other day. It was very interesting. We had a, um, a bunch of guys and, and ladies are, are running. And we all in agreement. Nobody has egos. Nobody has an agenda except to serve, right? I mean, every, nobody's got these. I'm going to say egos again because nobody's like one one person's above another. So I'm looking at it like this SWAT team, this football team. Everybody has different skills, and and we're just going in there together to make some change, you know, to get some things done. Because we know that if we can get divide, you know, if they divide and conquer us, we'll, we won't even move an inch. We'll just be okay. up there. There'll be no effect at all. Okay. So one of the things is the Taxpayer Relief Act. I think that, you know, the commerce tax that we want to, uh, we're working on uh, petitions now, a petition drive to repeal that. Um, the, uh, the other thing is the, let me see. One of the big things that I've been uh, being educated on is Common Core, mm-hmm. and um, <laughs> you know, which is a huge. It's 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 nuts, but I won't go into that. And then um, and then voter integrity. Voter integrity is huge, and we have such an archaic system, which is well, it's not even it's not archaic. We should actually go back to archaic, where we have paper ballots right. and they get voted individually or get counted individually, opposed to you being able to put a thumb drive in. Are are you familiar how they? To take the information from the mm-hmm. from the yeah. So now they use a thumb drive to take that and plug it into the next one. Kind of so, scary, isn't it? Yeah. So those are the three things that um, I'm reading more and more about, and and as I read more, I'll be able to be more effective. Okay. One of the things when whenever you start talking about just in general, whenever you start talking about uh, anything to do with voting, there's always there's always this group, and they've done a very good um, they've done a very good job over the years of. Uh, they, they always use key phrases to get people all riled up. Like, you want to take us back to the Jim Crow uh, uh, voter laws of the South that alienated uh, the African-American community because they gave them a litmus test and these questions that nobody can answer just so that they wouldn't be able to vote. Right. Um, but how, uh, what's, your, what's your message to people about why voter integrity is so important? Are you a proponent of, like, for instance, having to show a driver's license to be able to? I think... Um 
Well, some kind of government ID. Maybe you can't get a driver's license, but it's yeah. got to be verified. I mean, the amount of voter fraud and being – since I did work on the last senatorial campaign – we saw it firsthand, right. and that's the best knowledge you can. Yeah. And when you go to the, the Secretary of State's office, and everybody up the line from, from Las Vegas all the way to Carson City just denied it, you know, but we saw it firsthand. So I think voter ID is, is very important, and um, it's huge. How do you, how do you um, I guess, it's kind of the same question, but I'm going to re- rephrase it a little okay. bit. Different. How do you go about... Um, combating because again when, once you take that stance you get the other side that they, they always say the same thing like uh you're trying to scare people these are scare tactics these are things that don't happen these are things that are in fact people that conspiracy theorists come up with sure um how do you you say that you've that you saw this firsthand uh what, g- give an example of that 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 you would give a voter like I'm I'm playing devil's advocate. Right, I agree right. with you, but I'm trying to no, I, play I devil's advocate here a little. Um, I think that uh, one of the big cases was like the culinary union workers uh, being bused to um, you know um, to vote. Um, it's called to polling places. Mm-hmm. Um, just being given a ballot and said, you know, you vote for the way we're going to vote. The other thing that w- what was happening huge was um, uh, buses coming into Las Vegas from California and different parts of the country, and they were just dumping people off to vote here. You know, So I don't know, I didn't know enough at the time. I knew what was happening, because it was obvious. They weren't from the state. Um, right. We had people watching polls, and they were just going in there to vote. So I started learning after, I knew what was happening, but I couldn't pinpoint how, how they were getting it done. You know, And then what we were doing, we had people checking with, um, Checking on addresses, actually going door to door to see if there's a live person there. And a lot of times they were a vacant house. The person had, you know, there just wasn't somebody there. You know, they checked who voted. This was after the vote. They'd check, is, does Miss Smith really live here? They go to the house and find out nobody even lived there for the last 10 years. So um, I think that if pe- so as we all know, if people are willing to listen, you can change their mind. But some people, you could give them fact after fact, and they're not going to listen at all because they're stuck in in that you know Jim Crow type situation, right. like you're just conspiracy ther- conspiracy theorist, and it's just not true. Well, in today's electronic age, because I mean, I mean, look at the studio we're in now. I mean, live streaming, all kinds of weird stuff going on. That whole thumb drive thing that you talked about just scares me to death. However, it's amazing that we can bust people into vote, but yet every signature on a uh, on a petition has to be verified. Mm-hmm. Why do you suppose that is? And huh. how do we change that? Right. Well, I think it's because if a if say the governor on on the tax relief act or commerce act and his side doesn't want that petition to pass, they want to check those um, those signatures and and not validate or invalidate a lot of them, throw them out. If they want them to pass, then they'll just you know allow them to they'll allow them to be accepted, I guess. Um, so I, I think I'm answering your question, but I... No, um, you are. Yeah. And, and so the paper petition, for example, we need 55,000 pe- signed petitions or uh, signatures, um, but we have to go for 80,000 of them because we know that they're going to try to throw out as many as possible. So we're, we need to get at least 80,000 signatures to um, get a referendum, to, you know, get it on the ballot for an up or down vote for the, from the citizens. So you talked about Common Core as one of your hot buttons. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that was my hot button. It's the reason why I'm in. What have you learned about it, and why would you want it to disappear? Well, when it first when I first heard about Common Core, I always think of big government overreach, and now they're getting into our state, you know, that type of thing. Then I went to a class on Common Core, and I, I tried to absorb as much as I could. So one of the things that stood out was data mining, you know, taking – your kids' information from the time they're in kindergarten all the way to the time they're a senior in high school. Parents don't even know what kind of information they're asking for. And it's all sort of cloaked in this, um, um, let's just say Google or Microsoft gave your kid a, uh, what are they called, an um, iPad a tablet or something. tablet to use for free. And it sounds great in the public, you know. But they're, they're data mining every keystroke that, they're, that their kids are doing, whether they're on the Internet or working or not. They're, they're, ta- they're, ta- you know, they're keeping track of every little thing. But it's not just that. It's, they're not, it's not for education. They're profiling them for you know, 
how they act, how they respond, psychological profiles and things like that. So that's just one area. And then, of course, we look at the math and how that's calculated. That's just another whole crazy area that's involved in Common Core. Okay. You, 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 yeah, you answered my question because that's the big one for me too was the data mining, um, let alone just the, the not – there's no constitutional history. There's no, you know, I mean, history in, in general is really not even taught anymore in a lot of the high schools. Um, they don't even intermix, you know, like math and science and stuff and what it can actually do for the kids. You know, it's it's all compartmentized, or comp compartmentalized mm -hmm. on different things. So that's the reason why, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I'm with you on this one. Yeah. Baca, why are you running anyways? <laughs> What's that? Why are you running? I've already answered that one twice. You did? <laughs> I'll tell you again. You know why I'm running, Steve? Because is great it, veterans it, like it, you, actually. Is it commerce tax? <laughs> there you go. Good question. What's is that? it Common Core, commerce tax? Yeah. Is it, is it, is it the $1.5 billion tax increase? Is it? You know, that's the or one. Or did that somebody just lie to you? And, you know. <laughs> well, somebody lied in my district. That's why I'm running. Oh, Otherwise, I wouldn't be I'm, running. That's what I'm talking about. Right. I, I wouldn't be running against anybody that did their job. You're right. I mean, yes. we just, why would you want to replace somebody that's doing a great job? Mm -hmm. So that's that's what got to me. So I'll sort of go backwards a little bit. Here I'm try. I have this heart to find jobs for veterans because that, like I shared with you earlier. Right. Then I find out about the, um, the commerce tax, which is a job killer. Right. It's a it's a business killer. Then it's a job killer. So right. if I'm trying to work to get jobs, then it's going to make my job even tougher. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. I, I get you. <laughs> <laughs> And it truly, I, I was thinking about Steve there earlier. I thought oh, I met him in, in 2010, and actually I was observing Steve, not knowing him. And, and these are the kinds of guys, not that you're just here, he knows I like him, but these are the kind of guys that I would just observe, you know, when I was in Sharon's campaign. Right. And I'd say, this guy's, this guy's pretty awesome. So I'd start observing how you guys respond, how you guys act. And I said, these guys are tough, man. I want to join that team. I want to be right. part of that team. You know, so you're one of my inspirations. I appreciate that. Yeah. He's an inspirational guy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and, I, and I know him, and he's still an inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> so lunch is on you today. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what I'm saying. <laughs> right, right, Tony. So we're all under earth with each other. L lunch is on you today. Right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. You hear that, Jim? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, we got a couple minutes left. Tony, why don't you go ahead and uh, give the listeners a point of contact about yourself and how they can get involved in your campaign. Oh, sure. Great. Um, yes, you can go to votetonybaca.com and uh, see where I stand on issues. And it has, uh, has my um, phone number, my email address. Um, anybody want to get uh, involved in my campaign, this, whether they're inside my district or outside, can uh, call me. We can get them plugged into making some phone calls. We're doing some neat surveys um, in our in our districts okay. and uh, so they can do that or donate that'd be great to donate yeah. all right you have any big endorsements yet or you know um i went to the um the uh, i know this is not about me. i went to the um the, the police endorsement and uh, they asked me a question they go this came out of left field they go so who, who endorsed you so far and i said the um las vegas chapter Bandito's Motorcycle Club. Uh -huh. You should have seen their face. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> they, they almost fell off their chair. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> oh, my God. That's funny. So, anyways, Tony, thank you for coming on the program. Sure. And sure. we really appreciate that. So t did you give you boundary lines on your end? I did earlier, yeah. 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 I can I can see them again. That would be great. No, no, that's all right. You okay. see how much I was paying attention. I was, right. out there. I was outside shooting it up. But um, thank you for coming on, and we you really bet. appreciate it. And good luck with you in your race. And you're showing up for the um, the um, endorsement Part interview. Which one? The endorsement interview. Oh, yeah, I'll be there. Yep, so you guys can grill me. Yep. Okay. And there's a tea party thing at the Crowbar today, right? The, yeah, at 4 o'clock. Okay. Mm -hmm. You going to be there? I'll be there. All right, very good. Yeah. That's Tony Baca. What, what district you run again? District 5. Tony Baca, um, running for Nevada State Assembly District Number 5. This is Steve Sanson, Jim Jonas, and Troy Warren, Veterans in Politics. Until next week. Thank you.